Hi, it's Zeke with the Eastside Church of Christ in Baytown, Texas. Thanks for joining us as we continue our study in the book of Mark. In our previous study, in Mark chapter 2, we looked at verses 1 through 17, and we saw where, although Jesus is doing a lot of good, he's also garnering a lot of attention uh, from those who are going to be increasingly antagonistic towards him. And we see that going on more and more as we continue on into uh, Mark chapter 2. In verses 14 through 17 of Mark 2, Jesus had called a new follower, a fellow named Levi. We know him as Matthew, the author of that gospel. And Levi was one who had a very, very strong stigma attached to him. Levi was a tax collector. And not only was that bad enough, he was a Jewish tax collector, which added to the stigma and the, the critical attitude that other Jews had towards him. Jesus was getting to meet some friends of Levi. They're described to us as other tax collectors and sinners. And of course, this didn't sit well with the religious leadership of, of Jesus' time. He continues, though, to uh, draw their ire. Yeah, we're going to read about that as we continue. So let's head over to Mark chapter 2, and let's continue in Mark 2 and in verses 18 through 22, where we'll talk about Jesus and fasting. In Mark 2, 18, we read that John's disciples and the Pharisees were fasting, and they came and said to him, Why do John's disciples and the disciples of the Pharisees fast, but your disciples do not fast? And Jesus said to them, While the bridegroom is with them, the attendants of the bridegroom cannot fast, can they? So long as they have the bridegroom with them, they cannot fast. But the days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and then they will fast in that day. No one sews a patch of unshrunk cloth on an old garment. Otherwise, the patch pulls away from it, the new from the old, and a worse tear results. No one puts new wine into old wineskins. Otherwise, the wine will burst the skins, and the wine is lost, and the skins are well, or rather, and the skins as well. But one puts new wine into fresh wineskins. There's a problem with fasting. Fasting was an accepted way for those who wanted to show piety to do that. And rabbinical writings reveal to us that those who wanted to do that in Jesus' time, the Pharisees, uh, fasted twice a week on Monday and on Thursday. Uh, but when you look at the Old Testament, there was really only one time during the year when a fast was required of them. We'll talk about that in just a moment. So the Pharisees and their disciples fast, but Jesus is not fasting, he's feasting. And he's feasting with sinners and tax collectors on, on top of that. So you can see how there would be a, an uproar over the activities of, of Jesus. He's not acting like the so-called spiritual giants of his day. He's not acting like a person who wants to show piety, at least according to what they consider piety really is. Now, back then, Fasting was looked upon as a, a, a pious duty because it was intended to accompany mourning, repentance, humility. I said before that fasting was only required one time during the year. This is the passage that tells about it, Leviticus 16, verses 29 through 30. Through Moses, God said, this shall be a permanent statute for you. In the seventh month, on the tenth day of the month, you shall humble your souls. Now that's a metaphor for fasting. And not do any work. For it is on this day that atonement shall be made for you to cleanse you. So thinking about the atonement that God was making available for them on the day of atonement, the high holy day for the Jews, they were to consider themselves. The fact that they needed atonement, the fact that they were sinners before God, and the fact that God was willing to give them a way to draw nearer to them. And that should have instilled repentance and mourning and humility. But it seems that some were making a, a show of it. 
In uh, Matthew chapter 6, we're going to make a left to Matthew chapter 6. In Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, he talks about those who were fasting, but they wanted everybody else to know that they were fasting. In Matthew 6, and in verse 17, uh, rather verse 16, Jesus said, Whenever you fast, do not put on a gloomy face as the hypocrites do. For they neglect their appearance so that they will be noticed by men when they're fasting. Truly, I say to you, they have their reward in full. So Jesus isn't condemning fasting. He's just saying that this is supposed to be some kind of a, a, a very personal show to God of repentance and humility. Uh, he goes on back in Mark chapter 2 to talk about, uh, he, he gives a couple of quick parables uh, regarding really what it is that he's come to do and how inappropriate some things really are. And he shows that by telling them in verse 19 that he's a bridegroom. He's referring to himself. And while the bridegroom is with them, the attendants of the bridegroom cannot fast. Jesus is saying, this is why my disciples don't fast, because it's inappropriate. I'm with them. He says, but there's going to be a time later when I'll be taken from them, and then they will fast. There will be a time of mourning and seeking God in humility. But he says, right now is not that time. Jesus then talks about uh, sowing uh, a new patch onto an old piece of cloth in verse 21. He says, no one sews a patch of unshrunk cloth on an old garment, Otherwise, the patch pulls away from it, the new from the old, and a worse tear results. Now, if the old garment that Jesus is referring here to is the law of Moses, then what he's saying is that he didn't come to reform or to patch up the law. And, in fact, that's what he says in his Sermon on the Mountain, Matthew chapter 5. He says, I didn't come to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. He comes rather than with the intention of reforming it, Jesus is the end of the law, or the culmination of it. The, everything that the law pointed to sums up in Jesus. That's what Romans 10 verse 4 tells us. Jesus is the end of the law. He's not only the, 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 the cutoff point for that old law, he's the culmination of it. It all looked forward to him and his coming. And so he brought it to completeness, uh, all those shadows and the, 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 the prophecies of that old law, they find their fullness in Jesus. All those shadows find their substance in Christ. And because he ushers in a new dispensation, a fuller, better one, well, that old one isn't necessary anymore. But the Hebrew writer makes that very clear. In Hebrews chapter 8, we're going to go to Hebrews chapter 8. In Hebrews 8, towards the end of that chapter, Hebrews chapter 8, and in verse 7, the Hebrew writer says that if that first covenant had been faultless, there would have been no occasion sought for a second. For finding fault with them, he quotes Jeremiah, saying that new days are coming and a new covenant is coming also. When we get down to verse 13, he says, when he said a new covenant, he has made the first obsolete. Whatever is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to disappear. So this goes hand in hand with what Jesus said. In fact, I'm sure that perhaps the Hebrew writer was thinking about this as he wrote what he wrote back in verse 21 of, of Mark chapter 2, that the old doesn't work with the new. The new doesn't work with the old. There's something better. And when we think about that further, it reminds us that we can't mix the old and the new. We can't mix some of the old law of Moses with the new law of Christ. The new law supersedes the old. They're separate. They serve different ends. And the end for which the old was intended has been served. It's no longer needed. Jesus goes on to make the point in a different way in verse 22 of Mark 2. He said, No one puts new wine into old wineskins, otherwise the wine will burst the skins, and the wine is lost in the skins as well. 
but one puts new wine into fresh wineskins. Now again, Jesus is warning against misapplying his teaching. Wineskins were made from various hides or sometimes even the organs, such as the stomach, of various animals. And eventually they would, they would stretch, they'd wear out, they'd become stiff, stiff and, 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 and brittle. And putting new or fresh unfermented wine or grape juice into one of these skins was just inviting a big mess as the gases would, ex- would expand in, in that liquid, that old brittle skin wouldn't be able to, able to hold it. And pretty soon you'd have a big mess. It would, it would burst, spilling the contents, the precious liquid that was meant to be stored in, in those wineskins. Jesus' teaching expands beyond the old confines of the Jews' religion, specifically we're going to find that that teaching expands to include not only the Jew, but also the Gentile as well. In Ephesians chapter 2, in the book of Ephesians, and in chapter 2, and beginning in verse 11, the Apostle Paul talks about this, how now the Gentiles are included. In verse 11 of Ephesians 2, he said, Remember that formerly you, the Gentiles in the flesh who were called uncircumcisioned by the so-called circumcision, which is performed in the flesh by human hands, remember that you were at that time separate from Christ, excluded from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. Now the Jews were in the wineskin, if you will, of God's old law, the Mosaic law. But remember, Jesus came and ushered in a new and better covenant, a new wineskin, if you will. He says in verse 13, But now, in Christ Jesus, you who formerly were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ, for he himself is our peace, who made both groups into one and broke down the barrier of the dividing wall. In verse 16, That he might reconcile them both in one body to God, through the cross. So, Jesus warns in a couple of different ways against misapplying what he says. So, let's think about what we've read so far in, in Mark chapter 2, just in these few verses, 18 through, through 22. When we think about it, what, what's the purpose of fasting? Well, we read that it was to humble your souls, right? Right? And Jesus said back in Matthew chapter 6 that when, not if, but when you fast, you shouldn't do it as the hypocrites do. It's a very personal and intimate show of devotion to God. And as we go further, let's think again about the meaning of what Jesus says in verses 21 through 22. Now on the one hand, he's talking about propriety, right? Those things that are appropriate. And he makes that, that, that plain in verse 19 when he says that while the, group, the bridegroom is there, the, the attendants of the groom can't fast, but later on when it's appropriate for them, they will. But on the other hand, think about how Jesus' message calls for drastic change. And it would be difficult for a lot of people to make that change, but those who would be flexible enough would be able to... to make the adjustments necessary to be included in that new covenant. Well, let's continue reading about more Sabbath controversies in Mark's Gospel. Mark 2 verse 23 says that it happened that he was, as he was passing through the grain fields on the Sabbath and his disciples began to make their way along, uh, well, let me start that over. It happened that he was passing through the grain fields on the Sabbath, and his disciples began to make their way along while picking the heads of grain. The Pharisees were saying to him, Look, why are they doing what is not lawful on the Sabbath? And he said to them, Have you never read what David did when he was in need, and he and his companions became hungry? Now we entered the house of God in the time of Abiathar the priest and ate the consecrated bread, which is not lawful for anyone to eat except the priests. And he also gave it to those who were with him. And Jesus said to them, 
the Sabbath was made for man, and not man for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. Now there's a lot going on here, and I'm sure that that the religious leaders, the Pharisees of Jesus' time, I'm sure their heads were just exploding with what Jesus is telling them here. As far as the Sabbath goes, and what could or could not be done, the Old Testament was relatively vague. Now, it was specific about some things that they couldn't do on the Sabbath. Uh, for instance, the law said that there would be no work done on the Sabbath. We see that in Exodus 20, verse 10, that there would be no baking done on the Sabbath, that there would be no reaping done, no harvesting in Exodus chapter 34, there'd be no kindling of a fire. In the book of Jeremiah in chapter 17, we're told that, that they shouldn't even bear a burden on that day. And this all goes in keeping with that they would have a day of rest. It would be a, a, a time of rejuvenation for them. But by the time these well-meaning but misguided religious leaders came along, they began to add more and more and more stipulations to what uh, to what they could or could not do on the Sabbath. Rabbinic tradition tells us that there were at least 39 categories involving the Sabbath, what you could or could not do. And then in those 39 categories were a lot of subcategories concerning uh, the traditional law of what they could or could not do. For instance, these are just a few of some of those things. There would be no sewing. You couldn't tie two, two threads together. Neither could you untie, take apart thread. There would be no sifting. There would be no extinguishing of a fire if one were kindled the day before. There would be no writing. You couldn't put a sentence together on a, on a parchment or something like that. And these are just a few of the things. And, and the more you look into them, the more ridiculous they become. We see that, that you couldn't eat an egg that was laid by a chicken on the Sabbath because the chicken worked. You couldn't drag a chair or a table across the floor because it left a rut. And they considered that uh, uh, sowing or 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 or, or farming on on the Sabbath. It got more and more ridiculous. And so Jesus here, by referring to David and what he did on the Sabbath, puts a kibosh on their reasoning. Now I want us to to make a left to, to Matthew's gospel because the synoptics all add various details that help give us a fuller picture. And in the same incident in Mark's in, in Matthew's gospel in chapter 12, Mark chapter 12, Jesus gives, or rather Matthew gives us a fuller account of how Jesus brought this argument to an end. In Matthew 12 and in verse 3, let's just read Matthew's account. Jesus said, have you not read what David did when he became hungry, he and his companions, how we entered the house of God and they ate the consecrated bread, which was not lawful for him to eat, nor for those with him, but for the priests alone? Have you not read in the law that on the Sabbath the priests in the temple break the Sabbath and are innocent? But I say to you that something greater than the temple is here. But if you had known what this means, I desire compassion and not sacrifice." you would not have condemned the innocent. In four masterful ways, Jesus shows them how their thinking is all wrong. First of all, when he refers to the incident of David in, in 1 Samuel chapter 21, consistency on the Jews' part would require that they also condemn David for what he did. Because Jesus, isn't, Jesus and his disciples aren't doing anything really different than what David did. In fact, David did something that, was, that would seem to be much more against the law than what Jesus and his disciples were doing. Consistency would show that they would condemn David. But of course, they weren't going to do that. David was their great king. They revered him. Second, Jesus reminded them that even the priests worked on the Sabbath, and yet he says they're innocent. In verse 5, 
of Matthew 12. Have you not read in the law that on the Sabbath the priests in the temple break the Sabbath and are innocent? There would be bread to break, or rather bread to bake, and, and, and that show bread to be replaced, sacrifices to be performed on the Sabbath. All of that is work, and yet Jesus says they break it, but they're innocent of it. So clearly there are some things that are not strictly forbidden on the Sabbath. Third, Jesus says in Matthew 12 and in verse 6, I say to you that something greater than the temple is here. Now this is important. Jesus doesn't say someone greater than the temple is here, although that is true. Jesus is the someone who is greater than the temple, but he says something greater than the temple is here. I consider that what Jesus is talking about is his ministry, the the dispensing or the ushering in of, a, of the new covenant that we spoke about just a, just a little while ago. This ministry that Jesus was engaged in that was not only being engaged in by the authority of God, but in service to God. And so he reiterates his authority by saying that the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. And fourth, I want you to notice that here in Matthew chapter 12, Jesus offers an argument from Scripture in verse 7 where he refers to Hosea 6 verse 6 where God says, I desire compassion and not sacrifice. That's one of those figures of speech that leave out the words only or but and also. He says what he means is, I do not desire compassion only, or rather I desire compassion also and not only sacrifice. God's old covenant abounded with directives of mercy and compassion for everyone. And allowing the hungry to eat on the Sabbath uh, was a compassionate act and, and completely consistent with God's will. And when we go back to Mark chapter 2 and we see what the disciples of are, are, are doing. They're, they're plucking the heads of grain. Maybe they were even rubbing those heads of grain so that they could get the, the, the kernel inside. That's a far cry from reaping or harvesting, which the law did forbid. Mark chapter 12, verse 27, uh, brings up that wonderful statement by Jesus. The Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. Jesus cut through the stipulations of misguided men to remind the Pharisees what the Sabbath was for. The Sabbath was for man. It was a day for man to be not only physically rested but to be spiritually rejuvenated and restored. They had completely missed it. So let's ask some questions. Was it okay for David to, to eat the bread when Jesus refers to him in verse 25 of Mark 2? Have you never read that David what David did when he was in need and he and his companions became hungry? It would seem that, yeah, it was okay because God is all about compassion and mercy. Second, what does it mean when Jesus says that the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath? I think there is at least one way we can, we can look at that. I don't think it, it means that Jesus could just arbitrarily violate or redefine the Sabbath when it suited him. I think what it means is that if anyone understood the Sabbath, it was Jesus. He instituted it, after all, as Lord. And as the Lord of the Sabbath, he knew what the Sabbath law involved. He knew when it was violated and, and when it was being perverted by the likes of, of the Pharisees. And he also knew what it required and what it didn't require. He's the Lord of the Sabbath in every way. Let's go back to Mark chapter 3. And let's look at another Sabbath controversy in verses 1 through 6. Mark 3 verse 1 says that Jesus entered again into a synagogue and a man was there whose hand was withered and they were watching him to see if he would heal him on the Sabbath so that they might accuse him. And he said to the man with the withered hand, get up and come forward. And he said to, he said to them, 
Is it lawful to do good or to do harm on the Sabbath, to save a life or to kill? But they kept silent. After looking around at them with anger, grieved at their hardness of heart, he said to the man, Stretch out your hand. And he stretched it out. And his hand was restored. The Pharisees went out and immediately began conspiring with the Herodians against him as to how they might destroy him. We'll stop there for now. In verse 4, Jesus asks whether it was lawful to do good or to do harm on the Sabbath. Of course, he's already established that, right, earlier. In verse 6, the Pharisees and the Herodians are, are, are plotting how to destroy Jesus. The reason, of course, is because Jesus provoked them by, in their eyes, breaking the Sabbath. Did you see there in verse 2? It says they were watching him to see if he would heal on the Sabbath. Why? So that they might accuse him. Compassion and mercy were far from their minds. They just wanted something else to add to their arsenal of accusations against Jesus. And instead of marveling at God's mercy in the healing of this poor guy, they're enraged at Jesus' actions. The Herodians were not particularly all that good at law-keeping themselves. And we'll find out that they're going to become unlikely bedfellows with the, the, the Pharisees. But I want us to think for a moment about what it is that they had forgotten. The law provided for acts of mercy, even for animals. Exodus chapter 23, Deuteronomy chapter 22, remind us of the fact that when something happens with, a, with an animal, even if it's not yours, you, you, you do something to, to help it, to save it. Well, Jesus cut through all that and reminded them that even if it happened to them, they would certainly violate the Sabbath if it were one of their animals. Look at Matthew chapter 12. We were there just a moment ago. Let's go back there. In Matthew chapter 12 and verse 11, Jesus said, What man is there among you who has a sheep? And if it falls into a pit on the Sabbath, will he not take hold of it and lift it out? How much more valuable then is a man than a sheep? So then Jesus answers that question. Is it right to do? Is it lawful to do good or to do harm? It is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. Well, certainly. If the Jews could help an animal on the Sabbath, how much more a man? And of course, this is again in, in keeping with the institution, with the intention of the institution of the Sabbath, for man to be preserved physically and spiritually. I want you to notice, when Jesus asks the question in verse 4, is it lawful to do good or to do harm on the Sabbath, to save a life or to kill? They didn't say anything. They're not interested in engaging in debate with Jesus. They want to find a way to do him in. And again, Mark records Jesus' emotion and his strong reaction to their cowardice. In verse 5, Mark says that after looking around at them with anger, grieved at their hardness of heart, he said to the man, stretch out your hand. Well, Jesus' reaction isn't the only one that we see. We also see the, the, the reaction of, of the Pharisees who are enraged and they waste no time in recruiting allies to plan Jesus' destruction. And Mark tells of their unlikely cohorts, the, the Herodians. The Herodians were not necessarily, in fact, they were not at all a religious sect. They were a secular sect. They were a, a political party that was loyal to, to Herod, and Herod himself was not a religious man. But they also supported the rule of Rome, which, again, is part of what makes them unlikely allies with the Pharisees. They also supported the paying of taxes to Rome, which is another thing that makes them unlikely allies with the Pharisees. 
They perverted Jewish law to suit themselves, the Herodians did, and they were on occasion even idolaters. Again, I said before that politics makes for unlikely bedfellows, and we see that certainly with the Pharisees and the, and the Herodians. And later on in Mark, when we get to chapter 12, we'll see that the, the Herodians certainly would be willing participants in the Jews' scheme to do away with with Jesus. But I want you to notice something. Here in verse 5, we see that Jesus looked around at them with anger because they refused to do anything compassionate or merciful. They refused even to acknowledge mercy and compassion. I wonder if Jesus looked around today at us. Would he be angry with us? Would he grieve at the hardness of our hearts? I hope not. We're going to continue next time in our study of the book of Mark, and we'll continue with verse 7 of Mark chapter 3 in our next study. And I hope you'll join us. Thanks. God bless you.